Dermal piercings, microdermals, anchoring, micro anchors, thermal anchors. Bad idea? We're going to go through all the reasons today why I don't suggest getting them done or why I personally don't do them so that you can make an educated decision. Coming up next at Body Piercing Basics, episode number 28. So stick around. <laughs> channel. My name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I'm the owner and operator of the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located in Des Moines, Iowa inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. Now, we're going to go through this mainly because I had a suggestion in the comment section of the, this very channel where I was asking for some subject topics for future episodes of Q&A in the Kitchen, um, more specifically on tattooing, etc. But one of uh, our viewers, uh, Janine um, Estevan, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Sorry if I didn't, but thank you first off for the topic. She'd stated, you mentioned in uh, one of your videos that you don't do or don't like dermal piercings. Why is that? So I thought today we would go through why and give you some education on why I don't do it, why I'm probably never ever or nor have any interest in doing them in the things you should consider before getting them done. Um, first off, we should probably go through what anchoring is. A lot of people are kind of new to this, and maybe they're not used to the terminology, but they've probably seen it. Anchoring is a process where, unlike a piercing, a traditional piercing, which has two sides to it, easiest example is a lobe. You have the front and you have the back, and a piercing is done straight through it. Um, you can dictate how deep or shallow that is through that tissue. Um, and then you create it in a way that it tricks the body. It basically, basically the body is given a better option of producing tissue around it and making it easier to do that than to completely reject it. Anchoring, pocketing, uh, dermal implants, microdermals are done for in any area of the body that's basically flat or flattish. Uh, they're done by inserting a dermal punch, coring out a uh, kind of a core cylinder of tissue, pulling that out, and then making kind of a pocket inside under the dermal layer, and then inserting what is called a foot into that or an anchor that is oval shaped. And I'm going to take some close up photos of one of the pieces I have sitting around that was a sample piece somebody sent me. So look at that, probably somewhere around in here. Uh, they have a oval shape that's usually more more pronounced on one side. It's kind of the post section is off centered, um, and then there's little like cutouts. The idea being that your body will grow tissue around that or a pocket, and have like that single hole right there for the post to come through. Then it will grow into that cutout area in the anchor, making it more secure. Basically, in essence, you're doing the same thing. You are trying to make it easier for your body to make that pocket and accept the jewelry in that way than it would be to reject it, which is what your body really wants to do. The history of this is it started out with surface-to-surface -surface piercings. Once again, if you're new to it, you may not know what surface-to-surface -surface piercings are. Surface-to-surface -surface piercings are areas of the body that are pierced that are not two-sided. For example, your, even your eyebrow has kind of a ridge on each side. It's pronounced, it kind of protrudes out. It's kind of a more shallow protrusion, but it is a protrusion. Um, however, if you're trying to pierce the back of your arm, that isn't. It's kind of rounded, but it's not as pronounced. So what they would do with surface to surface piercings is do the piercing through that tissue and then put a piece of jewelry under there and try to do it in a way where the body was less likely to reject it. There was a lot of experimentation and there continues to be a lot of experimentation on how to do this properly. Um, probably the best option was the uh, surface barbells, which are kind of shaped like a, a flattened out U or yeah, like a U with balls on both ends and then kind of like that. Another option or something that was experimented, an idea was instead of putting the jewelry underneath and having this huge piece of metal that was more likely to reject, was to take two feet with a foot or anchors 
and place them in two separate locations and then have the body grow that pocket around the tissue. So yes, the bar area or the jewelry area would be would be visible, but underneath there, all there would be would be these two anchors. It had limited success. Usually what would happen is one side would stay and the other side would migrate or reject. Partly because you had this big piece of jewelry out there that was getting caught on absolutely everything. Kind of like if you if you can imagine having kind of a hanger, a handle hanging out of your out of your out of your arm. Um, out of that was developed single point piercings and dermal anchoring. Um, it became extremely popular. It seems about eight or nine years ago, everybody and their brother started doing them. Uh, I had already done research prior to that on surface to surface piercings and et cetera. I've had clients that requested it. We've done a little bit of experimentation on them and I had kind of come to the conclusion that it was a complete waste of everyone's time and not worth, uh, continuing mainly because of the amount of scarring that it produces. Um, and I'm going to get into more of that a little bit later as far as scarring. So, uh, when this became popular, I was kind of like, hey, haven't we been down this road before? Why is everybody treating this like it's a new thing? Um, the advantage of it is, is it allows you to pierce areas of the body that normally wouldn't be pierced. Um, things like cheeks, uh, arms, fingers, chest, lower back, um, all these places that we would have normally not been able to do that. So it's adding all this new diversity and new ideas. Personally, um, one of the reasons why I don't do this or some of the reasons why I don't do these, the first one being, I don't like them. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they interact with the body. I just don't like them. I Granted, I've seen it on a few people where it's like, yeah, that looks, that looks pretty cool. But the reality is, is it's not what I got into this for and it's not visually and artistically what I want to achieve. The second reason being is I was not trained to do them. Yes, I have enough knowledge. I have enough experience that I could probably learn how to do this fairly easily or contact one of my fellow piercers or find somebody to train me to do it and easily start doing them left and right. The third thing is, is that I, but I, I don't have any int intention of doing that. The third thing being is uh, when I pierce, I pierce for life, meaning, I do a piercing that that client can have for the rest of their life if they wish. Also, I want them to have the control over their own body and what's put in it to remove the jewelry easily if need be, if lifestyle changes or if they get a new job or what have you. So that was that's my thinking on it. Uh, then we get into all the other reasons. <laughs> But personally, that's the main threat. So what are the biggest problems with dermal implants and microderming, microdermals in pocketing? First one, number one, rejection. Though these piercings on certain individuals seem to last an extremely long time, 10, 15 years, some people have had them. Um, on a lot of people, they only last a few years and there's a lot of reasons for this. The first one being is the person who did it didn't know what they were doing. The second reason being is that generally they're put on parts of the body that come in contact with a lot of clothing, bedding, towels, um, surfaces, daily life. Think about if you had one of these on your ring finger, which was really popular on the old Instagram for a minute. Yeah, it looks really cute, it looks really beautiful, but the reality is, is that you're touching things with your hands, you're catching it on clothing. Every time you put gloves on, every time you put something around your, you know, put on a shirt, every time you move, et cetera, plus all your movement, all the movement you do with your hands is training and putting pressure on that, on that, on that pocket. Eventually, there's either some trauma to the piercing or there's some kind of problem with it or just general movement, and it gets to a point where the body says, aha, finally, finally, I can get rid of this foreign object. And it will begin to push it out, usually on one side, and then to the point where it becomes visible under the skin, that translucent layer of the skin, or it completely makes its way all the way out on one side. Once it's done that, 
it's going to slowly reject and leave a nasty scar in the process. It needs to be removed. And the only way to fix it is to basically redo it reheal it, go through the whole process all over again, which is going to produce even more scar tissue. So that's the first thing. Second thing is removal. This is not a piercing that you can easily remove. Granted, there are jewelry that we sell for normal piercings that are a pain in the ass to remove. I'll be the first to admit that most body piercing jewelry is designed to stay in the body for a long period of time. No way around it. That's the way life is. Anybody who's suffered with trying to get a captive ring out of a piece of uh, uh, piercing they can't see totally understands what I'm talking about. However, usually with a little practice, a little bit of dexterity, and possibly a little bit of help, they're fairly easy to remove. Especially barbells, threadless or non-threadless, uh, or, or fred, threaded or non-threaded. Both of those are fairly easy to remove. Um... Thermals require special tools and special skills that your average piercing enthusiast and collector isn't going to have readily available. Um, removal of them, if they haven't started rejecting, can be very difficult because basically you have to break loose any tissue that formed inside that anchor. Once you've done that, then you kind of push on one side and then pop out the, sh the short end and then the rest of it will come with it. However, sometimes, depending on the piercing, depending on the location, depending on how it was done, how deep it was done, it can involve having to use some type of cutting instrument to break loose the, uh, the dermal and get it out. Not always. Um, sometimes it's fairly easy. Sometimes you just grip on that thing and pop it out. And I have done that a number of times over the years. Here's where the problem of removal becomes a big issue is... You can't do it yourself, probably. Your friends can't do it for you. You're going to have encounter parts of your life, especially as you grow older, where the jewelry needs to come out. There is no question about it. Things like getting a new job, entering into some type of contest or some type of activity that's competitive and has rules against visible piercings. Maybe you're going to take an acting course. Well, you're not going to get many jobs with a um, piece of metal sticking out of your face. Sorry. Um, I know it's a part of your life and you're, you're sculpting yourself to be the unique little snowflake that you are. And that's wonderful and great. But understand that there are situations in life where it will impede your ability to get jobs, etc. So that's it. Then there's medical reasons. Um, if you're going in any type of procedure where they're going to put you under um, anesthesia, they're going to require you to remove the jewelry. And the reason being is that you're at a higher risk of going into cardiac arrest. And if they have to, they're going to use electricity to get your star heart pumping again, because that's important, because your life's more important than that piece of jewelry that's in your cheek. So they're going to make you remove it. And the reason being is having a conductive metal against your skin when that happens is not going to produce good results. It can cause burning. It can cause damage to the jewelry. It can cause damage to the piercing. Whole load of other problems. It could actually cause some health issues. So they will ask you to remove or isolate any metallic surface that's against you. And that's going to include that dermal anchor in your cheek which means you have to take it out, which means if you want it back, you're going to have to go through the whole healing process all over again in the procedure itself because you can't simply take it out. If you have a normal piece of jewelry, let's say uh, an upper ear cartilage, there is a couple of things when it comes to medical procedures that make that a lot easier to deal with. Like, for instance, you can remove it and put in a non-conductive material as a retainer for a short period of time. Also, there's a period of time, usually with most piercings, depending on how far they are in the healing process, where you can remove the jewelry for a short period of time and not have problems reinserting it. Other issue is imaging procedures like MRIs, where increasingly medical professionals are not allowing people that have jewelry in get these procedures. Now, you might say, I only buy the best jewelry. It's implant grade. It is the highest standard of blah, 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 blah. 
it's polished with angels' tears, and it's made of, of uh, I don't know, unicorn horn. Yeah, great, wonderful. The medical professional has no way of certifying that information. They have no idea what that material is made out of. And part of their ethical job is removing possible problems or risks or things that might lead to additional health issues. So they're going to make you take it out because that is the safest option. Once again, you have to remove the jewelry. You're probably going to have to have it professionally removed. And when you want to put the jewelry back in, you ready? You get to get the whole procedure over done all over again. You get additional scar tissue, and you're going to have to go through the healing process again. Ta-da, lucky you. Um, the other reason would be uh, emergency situations, especially are concerning to me because there's situations where you might have to go in for emergency surgery. Um, they The staff may not find it. They may not know how to remove it properly. Um, when I've encountered clients that have gone into this situation with just normal jewelry, usually they're not so much concerned about saving the piercing or saving your jewelry. What they're concerned with is getting it away from the body to avoid the possibility of causing problems. So they will do it as quickly as they possibly can. Um, I'm guessing with dermals, what the general rule is, is they take out the scalpel and scalpel the thing out. Scar tissue, fun, fun, fun. And the last one, I keep bringing it up, but let's cover it anyway. Scarring. This piercing, like uh, unlike other piercings where you might have an indentation scar. Like, for example, if everybody's taking their ear lobes out for a long period of time and had them close up a little bit, or maybe they've lost one over the years. If you look at that, it's there's an indentation scar there, yes. If somebody's a foot or less away from you, yeah, they can generally tell it was there. But for the most part, it's not a bright, ugly red scar that is on your face or on your hands or on your back or on your chest. With dermal implants, because uh, the punctures are fairly large, the scarring tends to be more intense. They don't fill as quickly, quickly, meaning that that tissue inside that hole doesn't fill outward as quickly. It tends to be a lot more prematic or a lot more uh, prematic but pronounced. Um, also, if it rejects, they tend to create kind of this weird line scar. It's a lot more visible. So there you have it. I hope I answered my I answered uh, Janine's uh, Janine's question, and I've answered your questions or gave you some things to think about before getting dermal implants, anchoring, surface to surface piercings, pocketing, etc. If you feel like I've covered something or you disagree with me or maybe you have some new knowledge that I'm unaware of, it happens. Please leave a comment. If you have additional questions about this style of piercing, please leave a comment. Also, I would suggest anyone who's considering doing this that you also read my blog on the subject that I wrote back in 2012. I will leave a link in the description. It's a little bit more detailed, might be a little bit more uh, Better thought out, sometimes the videos, I kind of skip over things and don't cover things as readily as I do in, in type because, hey, I take more time to do that. So um, if you have any additional questions, leave a comment, of course. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Um, if you would like to see more videos concerning body piercing, tattooing, and et cetera, please subscribe. Uh, hit that notification bell so that you know every time we post something new. And lastly, have a good day. Hope all your piercings heal with ease and without issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future.